welcome to the WBCSD Vision 2020 launch event. Vision 2020 is a really remarkable report put together by the team and also with its member companies involved. And it really has some key messages, but they can be summed up as it's time for action and it's time for a change of mindset to make sure all nine and a half billion of us by 2050 and the planet which we inhabit can all be living well by that time. Now, this is really about climate, this is about nature, but it's also about people, social justice, equality, living standards of people. And in the next hour, an hour and a half or so, we're gonna be hearing from some of the companies who are really doing a lot on this journey. We'll be hearing about what they find uh, are the challenges, where they're delivering, and where perhaps they'd even like to go faster. But uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce the president and CEO of the WBCSD, uh, Peter Backer, who's going to start with some opening remarks, and then we're going to have a wee bit of a chat. Peter, over to you. Great work on the report, by the way. Well, thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, thanks so much for uh, introducing me. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. It's uh, great to see so many of you online. Uh, it's a, an important day for us, and it's just two years of work with more than 40 global companies being put into a report that is now available for all of you uh, to see. What I want to do in uh, today's introduction is talk about uh, why this report, why now. I want to share some of its key messages with you. And then uh, last but not least, I want to stop at so what? So what for business? What is a business leader going to do? as and when he or she reads this uh, particular report. So why this report? We truly believe it is necessary to reinvigorate the sense of urgency. Now we see that sustainability is going mainstream. We have seen also that sustainability has become a rather complex issue and we really need to focus. In our opinion, there are three emergencies in the world today. One is the climate emergency, the second is the loss of nature or biodiversity loss. And the third one is the mounting uh, amount of inequality. In climate, we need to stay below one and a half degrees of warming to um, ensure there is a safe operating space for humanity. That means at today's levels of global emissions, we have eight more years of emissions before we hit the, the one and a half degree. If we want to stay below one and a half degree, we need to ensure that we halve the global emissions by 2030, and that we become net zero by no later than 2050. Nature, of course, talks about the extinction of uh, animals, of plants. Uh, and in this report, we clarify that of the world's GDP, more than 50% is directly dependent on the services that nature provides. When we talk about inequality, we live in a world where 1% of the population owns now 44% of global wealth. 10 people during the pandemic have gained their wealth by almost half a trillion dollars, whereas 160 additional million people were pushed into extreme poverty. If we look at COVID, we have noticed two things. One, it has clarified the interdependencies between these big global challenges that we face. And secondly, it has shown us how ill-prepared the world is for shocks like the pandemic. So we need a common vision to deal with the three big challenges. And that's where Vision 2050, the report we launched today comes in. Nine plus billion people living well within the boundaries of the planet is the vision. And these are not just a few simple words, these have really been built up from scientific evidence, as well as experts looking at the challenges. So nine plus billion tells us there's going to be two billion more people on planet Earth in 2050 than we have today. And all living well means we need to respect the dignity and the human rights of all. We need to ensure that all basic needs are met and we need to provide equal opportunities to all people. Within planetary boundaries, obviously, talks about staying below one and a half degrees of global warming. It talks about using nature sustainably. And it really talks about building resilient Earth systems. So here we are, 
You know, we have focused ourselves on the big challenges that are out there. We have set an ambitious target, an ambitious vision for 2050. And now we need to talk about how are we going to get there. And anyone who currently looks into the sustainability space will come across the words system transformation. We need change at the systemic level. But Vision 2050, Time to Transform, pushes beyond just these words. For the first time, we've delved deep into how do systems actually transform? What are the macro trends? What are the innovations? What are the enablers that make these transformations happen? This is a story about profound change at root cause level. We need to change the way we think. We need to change the way we act. So this system transformation is out there. But now the question is, how can we mobilize business into action? How do we turn this into a framework that will guide businesses in leading the transformation that the world needs? And for that, Vision 2050, Time to Transform, has included nine transformational pathways. We've looked at what are the essential business products and services that we provide to society, and how do each of these need to transform to deliver uh, on Vision 2050. The transformation pathways, they range from energy to food, from mobility to health and well-being, and a few more. And for each of these transformation pathways, we've set a clear vision. We have identified what are the key transitions that need to emerge in the coming decades. And very importantly, what are the business action areas that all companies should consider putting in place in the period between 2020 and 2030 in order to make this a story and a framework that really will guide business action. The danger, of course, of this approach is that we identify the challenge. We give you a long-term transitional pathway, and then it sounds like the engineers will fix it. And that is a bit too simple. And that's why one of the most important uh, elements of Vision 2050 is actually talking about the mindset shifts. What can we do to get to new thinking? How do we reinvent capitalism? How do we ensure that the business operations that we have are resilient? And how do we make sure that the models we have are really regenerative models? Of these mindset shifts, I would argue that reinventing capitalism is the most important one. This is a conversation about how can we make a longer term horizon in the decisions we make in capitalism? How can we integrate the externalities? And how can we hold companies, boards, CEOs accountable, not just for the financial performance of their business, but include the natural and the social capital elements, the impact their business has on nature and on society? By getting to this integrated long-term perspective in capitalism, resilience and regeneration will become automatic mindset shifts that follow. Obviously, the Vision 2050 Time to Transform Now is written for a business audience, but that's not the same as saying that business can do this alone. We need radical collaboration in the decade ahead amongst business leaders to really ensure we go for system transformation. No company, no CEO can do this on its own. We need to collaborate with scientists, with entrepreneurs to really drive the innovations that the transformation needs. We need to work with financiers, with investors to make sure there's enough funding for the transitions that we need and to make sure that the sustainable performances are actually rewarded. We need collaboration with all people. We are all consumers. The choices we make every day matter. And we need to talk about how can we really ensure that consumer behavior supports the vision. And last but not least, we need to work with governments, with policymakers, to put in place regulations and policies that will stimulate and accelerate the transformation rather than hinder. So what? What do business leaders now do? In my opinion, it's relatively simple. Each company, each business leader now needs to look at the three big challenges and say, how is my business impacted by those? Integrate this into your enterprise risk management system. Secondly, look at these transformation pathways. 
see where your business can play and what new business opportunities you see emerge. Because this is not a doom and gloom story. This is a story of new business opportunities. Then set ambitious targets, implement it in operating plans, and by all means, transparently disclose the progress in the world of ESG. So TCFD becomes mandatory, ESG disclosures become mandatory, the rules of the game will change. If we do that, we'll see that business is run well, well into the future. It's time to transform. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. And we'll discuss some of those points you've raised in a moment. But first of all, just a short video that really sums up what Peter's just been saying. very powerful video there. And Peter, some bold statements from you. I mean, you said more than once that we need to reinvent capitalism. That's quite striking when you're talking to an audience of some pretty big companies out there. Yeah, obviously, but it's not just me saying this, right? Uh, this is in Vision 2050, Time to Transform. Like I said, a piece of work that was made with more than 40 companies over a two-year period. But it's true. We need to change the rules of this game. We, we have seen clearly now that if we only focus on financial performance, we will ignore the environmental or the social impact. It has to become an integral part of the way we think about performance of a business. It has to be an integral part of the way capital markets will value businesses. I always say, you know, this reinventing capitalism in the core comes down to the notion that more sustainable businesses should attract a lower cost of capital. So that would mean that if I was doing things right by the climate or by the environment or indeed by uh, equality, I should be able to be able to borrow money at a slightly lower rate than someone who's not doing those things. Yeah, and, and we, we already see that part, you know, the bond market. Uh, we have seen examples. Uh, some of our member companies have finance constructions out there where are built in ESG targets for a few years out. If they meet those targets, they will attract lower interest rates. The big question now is how can we also integrate this into the equity markets? And that's where, of course, this argument of more sustainable, lower cost of capital will come in. And why is that so critical in those markets? Well, because that's, you know, where a lot of boards, CEOs, their incentives are determined by it. Um, and we, we do at the moment not have the full picture. You know, we, we need to work towards standards for ESG. So that when companies report on their non-financial performance, investors and other stakeholders can compare these data points, can see which companies uh, are more successful, not just financially, but also in the other aspect of their business. And that way, uh, investors can make much more informed decisions. Maybe the board should be getting uh, environmental share options rather than just financial ones. Maybe that would help to concentrate the mind. Well, yeah, in, in any case, uh, the incentive schemes in companies should really integrate the environmental and the social aspects and impacts of their businesses uh, into the packages that people have in their uh, remuneration. Is a way of kind of encapsulating this that it's often said that one of the problems with capitalism is it can make money from cutting down a tree. It finds it hard to make money out of sustaining that tree. Is that what we need to, to crack that problem? <clears throat> Yeah, it, absolutely. Uh, you know, we phrase it a little different these days. There is financial capital. And, and, you know, this is not a rant against capitalism. Financial performance, optimizing the returns on financial capital will remain a cornerstone of business. 
but there is also natural capital, your tree, and social and human capital, the impacts on society and on the people we deal with. We need to start optimizing the returns of, of businesses across all capitals. If we do that, then we align the performance with the challenges that we talked about earlier, and then the transformations that are required, you know, the move to renewable energies, to different forms of transport, to healthier and more sustainable food, will become an automatic uh, result of this new uh, view of performance. With such a big transition that you're talking about, there will inevitably be winners and losers, which is always tricky for politicians, and also tricky in the light of what you said about uh, equality and, and justice. So how's that transition managed? No, I think, you know, this, this big transformational moments, uh, you know, I, I come to so many boardrooms in our member companies. What we see there now, sustainability is truly integrated into corporate strategy. The transformations are the talk of, uh, of the moment in boards. Now, I, I'll give you an example. An automotive company is now really only talking about when and how can we exit the, uh, the combustion engines? How do we position ourselves in electrification of of mobility, these big shifts are now happening. The same needs to happen on, on the S, the social aspects of ESG, because what COVID has done, it has made the inequality part, the social aspect of business much more visible. And so in all honesty, I think business is relatively well equipped to deal with the, the E, the environmental aspects. It's doing a good job on the G of government aspects. I think collectively, the as of social aspects of business need to really be much improved. So in WBCSD, for instance, we are now starting with quite strong support from the member companies, a new project which says, what is the role of business in tackling inequality? Wow, that, that, that is really quite uh, extraordinary because you know, a lot of people you know, say that's a real transformation for business. And as you say, is, is hard, isn't it? These are, these are hard tasks for, for business to take on. Um, and they need the partnership, I guess, of governments and the people to come with them. It's a sort of a, th a three-legged lockstep, this, isn't it? No, no, absolutely. I mean, nobody has said that this in 2050 will be easy to deliver. But if you now look, you know, the social unrest, unrest that is everywhere, if you look at the need to make just transitions in jobs moving from, you know, fossil fuel industries into the renewable energies, there are so many aspects that we need to look into. And in the food system summit that is coming up uh, later this year, what you see there is the conversation about can we ensure living wages all across the food system? Well, these are the conversations that we need to have. Jobs, income, uh, of course, diversity. And, and if we do that well, uh, also the S in ESG will become a, a real part of business strategy. Peter, thank you so much. Really inspiring and insightful thoughts there. And now we're going to do something which I don't think I've ever come across in one of these kind of meetings before. We're going to hear a poem. And most importantly, we're going to hear it from a poem from someone who really is a captain of industry, from Nadia Godresh, who is managing director of Godresh Industries, who are a big uh, holding company uh, based in India, manufacturing chemicals, agriculture, property. So this is something I am really looking forward to. Nadia Godresh, the stage is yours. Thank you. The pandemic has brought to light the limits of our seeming might. For long, nature has been mistreated. It can react if it's been treated. The pandemic has made us all numb, but there is much more to come. It is no longer climate change within a tolerable range, but a climate emergency is what we now see. A crisis is what it's all about with fires, floods, as well as drought. It only serves to prove the point that everything was out of joint. All this we must first survive before we can ever thrive. The question now is really whether all of us can pull together. When what we need is a guiding light, a brilliant star shining bright. And if we are to play our role, we need to know both path and goal. And vision 2050 is the way, the dawning of a brighter day. We clearly see what it's about. The pathways have all been laid out. 
Don't you think it would be fine if everyone does all nine? Ambitions are all to the good, but it must be clearly understood. We will get collective traction only with committed action. The only way we can gain is to unitedly sustain. Thank you. Beautiful, but most of all, powerful. Thank you very much indeed. I'd, I'd love it if the text of that was available uh, on, on, the, uh, on, on the site so people could pick it up and, and, and peruse it later. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Nadia. That was really quite extraordinary. And I'm really intrigued to know uh, how you see these things from your perspective in a very fast growing economy. So when it comes to climate change, many of the problems and solutions are in economies like yours, those that are faster growing. Uh, does this give a company like yours particular responsibilities and particular power to work with suppliers and inspire other corporate houses to do things for the better? Kind of, if you can, they can. Indeed. Now, India, of course, is our base. But then if you were to trace our expansion to other lands, one very quickly understands the developing world is where we are. Our ambit spreads very far. In sub-Saharan Africa, we're everywhere. In Indonesia, we have our share. Of course, we think it's only fair that everywhere we take good care. Much can be learned by how we played in India through the last decade. The challenge of decarbonization is somewhat easier in the Indian nation. There is no uniform carbon tax, and yet the government isn't lax. Electricity rates are a mess. On coal, there is a special cess. Petrol and diesel are on the rise. The opposition finds this most unwise. The taxes have tripled the cost. Competitively, we have lost. Business doesn't find this nice, but it serves as a carbon price. Though so actually, we have a range. And this indeed is rather strange. Of course, it would be very nice if we had a single price, but all the same, these random rates have opened up many gates. At no further cost, we can abate our carbon emissions, and that's great. In the Goodrich Group, it is seen that our goals of good and green, though ambitious, will be done. Sustainability can be won. And so without partiality, our goal for all was neutrality, whether water, carbon, or solid waste, by 2020, we could make haste to eliminate our net emissions. We've made progress in all three missions. As technology takes the lead, green energy gets very cheap. At first, we thought we'd have to spend, but that's not true. For in the end, the more we fought, the more we slaved, we did invest, but we also saved. And solar has now hit the goal of being cheaper than even coal. We're sourcing solar electricity at lower rates than the utility. For quite some time, we've been exported as their finances still aren't sorted. A silver lining can be seen since it incentivizes green. There are many paths that we can see for achieving carbon neutrality. But the cheapest way is certainly through energy efficiency. Real interest rates are rather low and high returns quickly flow for any energy saving device. For business, this is very nice. In India, mandated CSR can help us go very far. Of our profits, 2% is required to be spent. Multiple benefits are what one sees with water projects or growing trees. Good livelihoods are created. Our carbon emissions are abated. Trees planted at a river source maintain the flow throughout its course. Different species can be tried. Useful products can be supplied like biomass or edible fruits, and yet the trunk and the roots can sequester carbon, clean the air, a win-win that is very fair. So while we decarbonize, why not also monetize? Neutrality can come with ease. Some may think I'm a tease. All businesses are not yet sold. Some it's up, oh, so I'm told. Energy intensive groups say it's tougher then for them to play. If you can turn all waste to gold, and if you can be very bold with inventing technology, any industry can see eventual 
neutrality. Technology provides much scope. There is no reason to lose hope. It doesn't mean that we can rest. We still must strive and do our best. For some it's early, for others late, but in good time all can abate. If we have the will and apply our mind, there are solutions that we can find. A uniform carbon price, of course, would be very nice. The government also ought to provide transitional support. In our own operations, we see, we'll soon approach neutrality. But when it comes to scope three, there are issues that we see. The transport footprint's very large. Indeed, this is a heavy charge. I believe it would be wise to suitably incentivize those whose footprint's very small while evaluating, take a call to look at price and footprint cost. Of course, some profit would be lost. But the carbon price need not be high. There is a simple reason why offset costs are very low. Trees and bamboo are easy to grow. With the right ingenuity, a profitable business we might see we will strive for neutrality in all the scopes from one to three. Our program will now be unfurled throughout the developing world. We should find a collaborative way to reduce emissions and save the day. Of course, we need our profits and planet. So we must heed our profits and planet. If we are both smart and thrifty, we'll do it long before 2050. Thank you. <laughs> I have to be honest, that was a genuine surprise that that answer was going to be delivered in rhyme too. And you set the bar extraordinarily high for the rest of us now. <laughs> We're going to struggle to, to deliver in quite such a way. Once again, longing to put that on, uh, on, on the site. And it's such a pity we're not all there because you'd be getting a rapturous round of applause. I think maybe I could just set a challenge to other people in the chat box. They could maybe come up with a limerick in the next hour or so. <laughs> maybe something that rhymes. See if anybody can crack that. But uh, thank you so much, Nadir. That was absolutely e extraordinary and, and, and very, very powerful. And we're going to move on now to the, uh, the so-called uh, fireside chat with a number of uh, captains and captainesses of industry uh, coming up. And uh, I say it's a fireside chat. It is, of course, now a hydrogen fire. So there's no, uh, no carbon being emitted here, only a little water vapor and, and hopefully some heat and light. Uh, so first of all, let's uh, introduce who we've got to, who's coming up to speak today. Uh, we have Claudia Azevedo, who's a, a board member and CEO of Sonai, the Portugal, a Portuguese based uh, technology for retail company. We have Jean-Pierre Clamadio, who is chairman of and board of, chairman of the board of directors for, excuse me, for Engie, the, the French uh, en based energy company. We have uh, Colm Kelly, who is global leader of policy and purpose for PwC. And we have uh, Gail Schuler, who is a uh, Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer for 3M. Welcome to you all. Thank you very much indeed uh, for, for, for joining us. Um, I'm really, really looking forward to, uh, to the chat we're going to have. And in fact, I'm going to start, uh, start with, with Gail. Um, uh, the, uh, the report talks a lot about um, examples of bold targets we should have and action. So what kind of solutions are you getting behind and why do you think cooperation in forums like this is so important? Oh, thanks very much, Tom. And I have to admit that it, I've never followed someone with so much rhyme. And this, this is uh, um, incredibly daunting in that regard. But it's been a great pleasure to participate in the generation of WBCSD's Vision 2050. And it fits so well with 3M as a corporation, our focus on science, my own background in science, and the criticality um, that I believe there is for reinventing and transforming the world to a better place by 2050. At 3M, we base our whole strategic sustainability framework around science. And we're looking at science for circular. And so in that, we look for science for circular, science for climate and science for community. And each one of these has key solutions that we need to get behind and all require collaboration with others. There's our sustainability value commitments that every new product we launch must have an, a way that, it, that they advance sustainability. And in doing so, that's how we transform our portfolio. But we need to work with our customers and our suppliers to make those things happen. When it gets to a circular economy, there's no more clear space than a circular economy about how we need to collaborate in each part of, 
of the whole circular economy, whether it's the raw materials producers to those of us who create products, to our customers who use them, and then what happens at end of life to become renewable. Brings me to, to climate. Um, very obviously an integrated uh, challenge that we're all facing around the world. We need to collaborate together to reinvent our electricity grid for renewable energy. We need to collaborate together to electrify our transportation industry. And as, as uh, so many people have already articulated, particularly Peter, on the science for community, we are facing an equity crisis in the world as well. And so beyond the environmental piece, the social piece needs to come together. And we see our role is really important when we're helping people live well. That means providing effective N95 respirators to everyone who needs one. That means providing solutions to help eliminate health healthcare acquired infections. But it also means advancing knowledge and expertise in scientific areas in STEM to really help the world come together, have more people with better ideas helping to advance these challenges. Gail, you mentioned the importance of science a couple of times in that, uh, those remarks. I was just wondering if you thought one of the possible benefits from what we've seen with COVID is a, perhaps a renewed respect for science, uh, both in terms of how we've seen it roll out with the predictions of how the uh, pandemic would go, and of course with, with vaccines as well. Do you think that could help in a way, scientists coming to the fore and being seen to, well, to, to really help us? Well, as a scientist myself, that's an easy question. Yes, I think this is tremendously important. But also, um, one of the things that 3M has done over the last several years is, is, um, is sponsored and brought forward a state of science index where we have interviewed people from all around the world on what their perceptions are around science. In, in last year's analysis, we actually did a piece pre-pandemic and a piece post-pandemic. And what we saw were two really important trends that address exactly the question you're asking. It was that yes, people are seeing science as being more and more important, but among those big challenges that people see science must address, yes, it's global pandemic, but it's also these sustainability challenges that we're facing, whether they're climate or plastics waste or water usage, they're seeing that environmental piece as being absolutely critical and science being the, the key way to address those challenges. Yeah, science has a lot of the answers, but the times we must be prepared to listen to it as well, not, not block our ears, which I think is, is important. Um, I'm gonna move on now to Claudia Azevedo from, uh, from Sonai. Uh, Claudia, when it comes to the environment, are we seeing consumption, shopping, if you like, moving from being part of the problem to part of the solution? And, and if so, how can we kind of speed that up? I'm not sure if I can hear you, Claudia. You may just need to unmute there. Okay. Thank I, you. I, yes. Did I, you get my question? Okay. I did. I did. I did get your question. Lovely. On you go. As, as a retailer, especially as a food retailer, I think we sit in a place that uh, we really can um, have a circular and systemic uh, change. You know, we sit between the producers, the farmers, the series of operators, logistics that have a heavy uh, footprint in terms of sustainability and the consumer. So we can sit there and, and do this systemic change. And, and we really believe uh, at Sonai that we have to value create and recreate and not value extract. And um, just to give you some examples of, of our case, for example, plastics is a big thing in, in retailing. And we have committed a, a lot of uh, energy to, to reduce that. We have a, a public commitment um, to eliminate uh, single use plastics from our operations by 2025. Uh, we also have a goal in 2025 to only have in our own brand 100% recycled plastic. We are now at 75, which is which is very good. It's it's very complicated because it's one package and can have plastics from all over the place, all, all suppliers. So um, and also the, sort of the packaging for them from the e-commerce. You know, this is a year where e-commerce had a boom, and when you receive at home a little something small you've you've bought with a huge package. Um, so as as retailers, and we also have to uh, see that in consumption. And food, as a, as a food uh, uh, retailer, um, you know, we, we have to empower and educate our consumers. We do a lot of school. Uh, we, do, we reach about 30,000 students every year with healthy eating. Uh, we have a club of, of farmers that we've had for about 20 years where we try to share with them 
technologies, new technologies, even learnings from places like the World Business Council, the World Economic Forum, uh, and to, to, to bring them up, up to speed um, with what, uh, what's top uh, in terms of sustainability. Also, buying local is very important uh, because then you don't have uh, the transport uh, um, effect. And just an example, we've, we've made an agreement here with the wheat producers here in Portugal and we buy 80% of their wheat. We have a sustainable aqua aquaculture uh, here in, in the south of Portugal. Uh, and so, you know, as a retailer, I think we can really make a, make a difference. The food systems is one of those streams that has been identified in this in this new, new document. And last but not least, you know, food waste. Food waste yeah. uh, in, in, the, in the chain that gets off the supermarket, food waste in the supermarket, and food waste at home. It's gigantic and it can make really a big difference in, in the way that we use the resources of, of the planet. Well, you, you kind of anticipated my follow-up question there, but it was going to be about food waste because kind of by definition, food is a consumptive model. You know, it, it goes into us. Um, but how can you hope to influence food waste in the home where I think still the majority of it is? Sure, we, we, do, we do a lot of, of, of programs um, to help people sort of uh, shop uh, the, the, just the necessary quantity. So we don't have... You can, you can buy a big bulk, but you can buy one piece. Uh, we do things in stores. For example, we have different labels for the, the food that is coming up uh, in sort of the valid, the valid date. And so people can buy that at a cheaper price, but they know that they have to consume, consume that in the next one or two days. So they, they buy in, 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 in smaller parts. It's, it's all of education. It's education at home. Uh, you know, we have a, a website of uh, how to uh, sort of um, do recipes with uh, what you have at home. Uh, so a lot of it is, is communication and being able for a family of one to buy uh, the food that you need for a family of one or a fa the food you need for a family of six or seven. So have those options available for consumers. Claudia, thank you very much indeed. And now I'd like to bring in uh, Jean-Pierre Clamadieu, who is, as I say, chairman of the, the energy company, Engie. Uh, you've talked about accelerating the transition towards a carbon neutral economy. First of all, are you seeing this acceleration and how can work like Vision 2050 help to focus corporate efforts for action rather than just discussion? Important though discussion is, of course. Well, in fact, there is indeed a, a very good timing um, uh, because we are all hopefully at the end of a very significant pandemic, which demonstrated in a very obvious way that our planet is very fragile. Uh, and I think uh, a year ago uh, or a year and a month ago, no one would expect the massive impact that we've seen uh, uh, in the way we live, in the way we operate due to this pandemic. And I think this brought a real sense of vulnerability. But also, I think we've demonstrated that we have the ability to make breakthroughs, uh, to adjust and to react. Frankly speaking, I was very impressed to see in a company like Engie, but I'm sure you had uh, similar experiences uh, uh, at 3M, uh, Sonae, or at PwC, in overnight, we put 50,000 people uh, working uh, uh, in home office. Uh, we would have thought that it should take years to do this. Overnight, we did it. And it shows that when we see emergencies, we have the ability to react. And frankly speaking, at least seen from uh, where I sit in, uh, in Paris, uh, I think companies have demonstrated an ability to react, which is very impressive compared to what some governments were, were, able, to, uh, were able to do. So I think it gives us the legitimacy, but also the responsibility to act very quickly. And I think that Vision 2050 indeed put a strong focus on the, the need to act very, very quickly. And when it comes to uh, energy transition, yes, indeed, we've made very impressive steps in the past few words, few years, sorry, uh, now, renewable in terms of cost are very close to traditional sources of, uh, of energy. We are seeing companies putting billions of dollars, billions of euros uh, to accelerate this transition. We are, we are one of these companies, but I see utilities, I see uh, traditional uh, energy, not to say uh, oil companies, putting also a lot of resources into this energy transition. All of this with support in various forms uh, from government. So yes, I'm optimistic that the transition has started very significantly, but we need to accelerate. 
And what's good about Vision 2050 is that it gives us a, a, a clear message regarding the need for acceleration and alignment. Alignment between businesses and something very good about WBCSD is that it's not just utilities talking to utilities or chemical companies talking to chemical companies. It's us, companies along supply chain, in some cases, very complex supply chains, working all together. And second, we need to reach out to governments uh, and we need to make sure that there is a good alignment be between what government wants to achieve and what companies can bring to the table. But is your message to other companies and to governments that you take from the pandemic is kind of to be bold, that you've seen how speedily things can change, companies can change, governments can enact some, some pretty bold and restrictive things themselves, that we should kind of take heart from that and think we can act fast and we can act big. This is, this is exactly the message I was, uh, I was willing to share. In fact, yes, indeed, we've been bold because we had, uh, there was no choice if we wanted to continue to serve our customers in the case of Engie. And Engie's supplier of energy is indeed uh, uh, providing something which is absolutely necessary for everyone, companies or households. Uh, we had to find ways to continue to deliver to our customers uh, with a lot of constraints uh, coming on top of our shoulders uh, overnight. And I think we did it. Uh, we've seen uh, vaccine companies, to take a different example, uh, pharmaceutical companies being able to develop vaccine in a very short period of time. So yes, the message is be bold, uh, realize that there's an emergency. Pandemic and climate change have a very different, uh, have a very different time scale. I mean, the pandemic came very quickly. Hopefully it will disappear at some point of time very quickly. Climate change is coming step after step and it won't disappear. So we have to realize that there is a need to be bold and move quickly. And this, I really think this is what uh, Vision 2050 is all about. And uh, I was very glad to be one of the participants which yeah. uh, helped WBCSD, WBCSD come up with this, uh, with this vision. It's often said that the problem in promoting fast action as a reaction to climate change is unlike coronavirus, climate change doesn't appear on people's death certificates. So it doesn't concentrate the minds in, in the same way. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, Colm Kelly, who's global leader of purpose policy and corporate responsibility for PwC. And I'm just wondering, uh, Colm, uh, to what extent are you now seeing auditing for environmental performance, not just financial performance, being taken seriously by companies invest and investors? Are, and are the two beginning to align or is that just wishful thinking? Uh, thanks, Tom, and hi, everybody. Um, well, well, actually, for auditing, for the assurance over the data, it's it's really early days. And that's quite a telling comment, which I'll come back to, actually. But there certainly is growing interest, maybe significant and growing interest in non-financial data, not, not just related to climate, but to climate and social capital as well. And that's coming from investors and from businesses generally. Uh, but we should be clear, there's a pretty major challenge here because, of course, we don't have a common standard for reporting this data, which means actually we can't even move on to the auditing question. So we really do need a global standard to provide consistent, comparable data in this space. And there's progress in that conversation. Uh, but to echo uh, repeated comments from other speakers, it's too slow, we're not moving quickly enough, and it's really critical, it's now urgent to land this. But I also want to bring a bit of realism into the conversation because the picture in terms of the appetite for this dynamic is actually mixed, right? Not everybody's on the same page. And so the investor community, for example, isn't monolithic. There's actually quite a range of perspectives on both the objectives and the responsibilities of investors and businesses. And there isn't a clear view, for example, on what stakeholder capitalism actually means in practice. And honestly, for many businesses, um, the default model is effectively, therefore, still what I might describe as the old model, where you have this default of the primacy of the financial and the short term. Uh, I had a recent conversation with the CFO of a Fortune 50 company, and on their most recent quarterly earnings call, there was not one question related to anything to do with any topic related to E or S or G. And the entire discussion was focused on uh, on the financial and on short-term indicators for financial performance. And, and that's really why this uh, agenda of reinventing capitalism is so important because we have to redesign this model 
if we want to see a change in the behaviours which follow. And, and non-financial reporting is necessary, but it's not sufficient because we also need to focus on defining and then maybe even redefining the essence of corporate purpose in the first place and the responsibilities owed by business, not just in financial terms, but also to natural capital and social capital, as Peter said earlier. Uh, when you uh, move down that path, you also have to have a governance framework which supports this broader set of responsibilities, which in many businesses we currently don't. And maybe last but not least, you then have to have businesses uh, and many of the WBCSD members are well on the journey of this, which is why this is so important. You need businesses to align their strategies and critically their incentives with this broader range of objectives and responsibilities. Uh, and I just want to be clear about one thing as well. This isn't about a choice between profit or purpose. And that's very often how this debate can be characterized. And, and honestly, that's a bit of a cop out. This is about profitable, competitive businesses like the ones on this call delivering outcomes which are sustainable and acceptable to the communities within which they operate. And frankly, that's the only way in which businesses will retain their license to operate. So this reinvention, if you like, of markets and of capitalism, I mean, uh, to echo Jean-Pierre, it can only be delivered with a share by a shared endeavor. We have to have businesses like this community taking a lead, but we also need those businesses to sort of work with others up and down the supply chain, as we've heard, effectively through their ecosystems. And we critically need businesses to support governments to drive these kinds of change. I would strongly endorse what Jean-Pierre said in that respect. And I think governments probably underestimate the willingness of many businesses to step up and provide that support. And this is urgent. We're not moving with sufficient pace or scale to address the challenges that we've been describing. It's fascinating. I just want to push you a little bit more on that idea of a, of a kind of environmental or maybe an ESG metric, because it's often said, and I think it's very true, is what's measurable becomes important. Uh, we see this, of course, with GDP, gross domestic product. It becomes a kind of, you know, a, a fitness test for an economy and everything else doesn't matter. When do you think we might see something that's kind of respected and, and uniform throughout business, Tom? Well, there's, there is good work underway, both in, defer, in terms of defining the range of metrics which could be used to report against in both the climate space and in the uh, social space. And uh, in many respects, they reflect the underlying framework of the sustainable development goals as they should. So that's a good foundation. Um, I think the challenge is the pace at which you convert those into common standards, which are then embedded in the reporting ecosystem across the board. So, you know, when do I see that likely to happen? Um, I think it's likely to be years rather than months at the pace of the current progress. And I would suggest to, that this community can encourage an increase in that pace uh, as, as fast as possible. I agree with you, it is really urgent to get to that point. Mm. Well, thank you very much. And I'm gonna open it up now. Please, by the way, I'm gonna direct questions to people, but if you have, if you wanna come in, I can see if you wanna raise a hand. So if you've got a point you wanna make, then, uh, then, then go for it and do so. Um, I just wanted to come, briefly come back to, to you, Jean-Pierre. Um, electricity <laughs> is so vital in so many of the sustainability transitions, isn't it? Moving away from burning stuff to, to wattage underpins so much of, of what's expected. I mean, there's a huge task out there, not even by 2030, let alone 2050. No, oh, yes, and I think it's, uh, once again, I think it's moving, uh, transformation is moving very quickly. We are seeing today a number of, uh, of countries setting clear target for um, exiting uh, fossil fuel as a source of, uh, as a primary source of energy within their, uh, within their geographies. And we see private sector moving at a, at a fantastic speed. I mean, we are talking uh, tens of billions of euros being invested to develop uh, to develop uh, uh, photovoltaic or, 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 or wind-based uh, uh, energy. We are seeing efforts regarding uh, uh, renewable gases, biogas today, hydrogen tomorrow. So I'm uh, pretty optimistic that there's indeed a, a, a lot of uh, efforts being done to bring the new systems we need. But uh, to go back to, our, to the point that it needs to be a shared effort, it can be just the utilities. I mean, what the transportation sector is doing, what the housing sector is, uh, is doing, construction, all of these have a role to play, 
And what's good about coalition like WBCSD is the ability to tackle a problem throughout the supply chain. Uh, and I really uh, strongly believe, and it's one of the reasons why uh, I've been uh, very supportive to what uh, Peter and his team uh, are doing at WBCSD, I do believe that working together helps us get faster to the point uh, with, uh, and make the most out of the resources we are willing to, uh, to invest there. Thanks very much. Uh, Gail Schuler, this report, Vision 2050, and much of the discussion you've had isn't solely about environment. It is about uh, equality and, and, and social justice as well. Do you see them as, as, as all of a piece in, in your business? Well, I think there's a lot of overlap. You know, when when you're specific in an area, whether it's renewable energy or diversity and equity, um, you, you tend to see those individual pieces. But once you step up to the level of a Vision 2050 or leading a sustainability effort for an enterprise, you tend to span these different spaces. And so what we see is things related to the broader definition around environmental justice, for example. So are the communities, we largely see that the communities who are impacted most severely by climate challenges, poor air quality, lack of water availability, pollutions, we get concerned that they may be impacting those least able to manage them. And that's something that we, we need to bring forward. And I will reinforce that if the more people we can, the more smart minds we can get working on the scientific challenges and finding those solutions, the faster we're gonna be able to make progress. Uh, Claudia, I wonder if I could pick up with you uh, something that uh, I think it was uh, I think it was Colm said that we might hope everybody's on this journey, but they're not. You know, the, the, there are, if you like, some some laggards out there or maybe they're in industries which find it very, very difficult to transform. Uh, what's your experience of this from, from Portugal and also in the, in, the, in the rest of Europe? Sure, I mean, there are some, some laggards behind, but I think that the, the public pressure and mainly the public pressure from the younger generation is huge. <clears throat> and so I think we will, there is a whole chapter on shifting mindsets, but I, I think, you know, based on um, science, based on what we see, for example, the COVID pandemic, everybody knows now it's, it was a, 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 a man, not a, a, a um, it was a climate, uh, uh, nature, I would say, uh, problem. Um, based on all that, I mean, the, the facts are, 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 start, are starting to stack up. And I think even the laggards, they will be uh, converted. If they're not converted, uh, there needs to be, obviously, uh, as we say, this partnership between business, government, and non-governmental organizations. We need to have uh, laws and, and benchmarks. And if they're not converted by good, <laughs> by a good objective, they will be converted by a need to, uh, to uh, abide by the law and they'll lose customers unless they get on board and certainly sure. if not immediately now in the short term in the pretty near term i'm sure yes it's, uh, it's already happening you see very young sustainable brands uh, uh, getting a good market share mm. um, colm kelly uh, peter talked uh, powerfully about the need to reinvent capitalism are you up for that as a company that's very much at the heart of it? Uh, it absolutely, without question. In fact, I don't think there's a choice, uh, Tom. I, I think that the only way in which we can have a sustainable business model, any of us, is by participating in a sustainable economic system which lives well within planetary boundaries. So there, there is no plan B, there's no alternative. Um, uh, but I do think it reinforces the challenge of this systemic change because we have to recognize that the system that we largely currently operate in was designed to do something different and designed very successfully to do something different for quite a long time. And I think it's really imperative to then recognize the change necessary to the underpins of that system to result in different behaviors, which result in different outcomes. I mean, you know, it's, it is entirely clear that we continue to overextend the capacity of the planet based on our current activities. It's entirely clear that that's just unsustainable and it's entirely clear therefore that changed behaviors are required. And, and I hope we find the right mix of in incentives and rules if you like, but I do think it'll be a mixture of all of those things because we have to redesign all of the elements of that system which drive those behaviors. Jean-Pierre, everyone's talked about the need for, for action and speed what stops you going 
faster? Is it the fear that you're going to be undercut by a dirty competitor, or is it simply kind of technology? We can't invent any quicker. Well, there's a number of things. I mean, technology, we have a number of solutions available, but uh, there are still areas where we are struggling. And if I think, for example, of storage, the ability to store uh, energy in the form of electricity, that's the challenge. And uh, yes, we need chemists, uh, Gail, to help us uh, uh, find the right solution to build more efficient uh, storage uh, technology. Uh, but sometimes it's uh, because we are not, it's our own behavior. We are not bold enough. We have uh, also difficulties. I mean, a CEO, I'm not a CEO, I'm the chairman today. So I, uh, I have the ability or the, the comfort to have a, of a luxury, to have a bit of a longer term vision. But the CEO needs to go in front of a market every three months to report results. Uh, and sometimes it makes it a little bit more difficult to look uh, at the distance. Uh, although at NG, we are currently working on uh, what, how we can frame a commitment for carbon neutrality, which is uh, for us probably uh, 20, 30 years ahead of us. Uh, so we need to find this, uh, this balance and be, uh, and be bolder. Sometimes governments are not, uh, are not helping us because they have difficulties also to, to give us a long-term framework. We are in industries where uh, payback are pretty long. Uh, we are uh, large users of capital, so we need visibility when we invest. And we would like to have a clearer framework. If I think of uh, carbon pricing, for example, we've made some progress, but we are not yet at a point where we have full visibility on what will be the carbon pricing mechanism at work in Europe and in other parts of the world in, in the next 10 to, uh, to 15 years. But I don't want to, uh, to, 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 uh, to push to put the burden on uh, someone else's shoulder. I think the challenge for us <clears throat> at board level, uh, at management level, is to make sure that we indeed develop a long-term vision. And it's why, uh, once again, I like this 2050 exercise and make sure that we align resources to move, uh, to move faster. And I hope if there is one good thing out, coming out of this terrible uh, year 2020, it's really the willingness to tackle the issue, the fact that we understand that this planet indeed is vulnerable and that we all need to move very quickly uh, to make sure that we can uh, protect it for our generation and the ones to come. Well, thank you all very, very much indeed. That was really, really strong uh, from my point of view. I hope uh, you in the audience uh, watching and listening out there got as much from it as I did. Uh, we didn't hear any more rhyming, cu rhyming couplets out there. I'm sure they'll be, all be beavering away to put something up on their Twitter account a little later on so we can all judge their poetic prowess. Anyway, uh, for now, thank you very much indeed uh, to Gail Schuler, to uh, Claudia Azevedo, to Jean-Pierre Clamadio, and also to Colm Kelly. And of course, thank you to Nagesh earlier on. So uh, that's it from me. Thank you for all watching. Thank you for joining the WBCSD Vision 2050 launch event. To make the most of your event, please do return to the homepage where you can access the Vision 2050 report and explore resources that complement this groundbreaking piece of work. The platform will remain open for another 90 minutes. You can also visit us at timetotransform.biz. We look forward to connecting with you again soon.